Coming up in the next hour of local news on Arizona PBS, on Arizona Horizon, a debate between the two candidates for Maricopa County Sheriff. On Cronkite News, how a flu vaccine event at One Valley Hospital could provide a roadmap for mass COVID vaccinations. And on Break It Down, a look at some of the fear and skepticism surrounding a COVID-19 vaccine. That's all ahead in the next hour of this Arizona hour of PBS. Local news is made possible by contributions from the Friends of PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the special election 2020 edition of Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Tonight we feature a debate between the two candidates for Maricopa County Sheriff. The sheriff leads the third largest sheriff's office in the country, overseeing the nation's fourth most populated county. This debate is a joint effort between Arizona PBS, the Arizona Republic, and KJZZ Radio. And joining me to moderate is Yvonne Winget Sanchez of the Arizona Republic and Steve Goldstein of KJZZ. This is not a formal debate. It's an open exchange of ideas, an opportunity for give and take between the candidates. Interjections and even interruptions are allowed, provided that all sides get a fair shake. And we'll do our best to see that that happens. Joining us now for tonight's debate in alphabetical order, Democratic incumbent Paul Penzone, a former Phoenix police officer who worked in law enforcement for over 30 years and ran the silent witness program for seven years. And Republican challenger Jerry Sheridan. Sheridan has worked in the sheriff's office for 38 years and was the chief deputy to the previous sheriff, Joe Arpaio. Each candidate will now give a one-minute opening statement with the order determined by random selection. Closing statements will be given in reverse order, and we begin with Jerry Sheridan. Thank you. Well, thank you for organizing this event. It's a great opportunity, the first uh, we've had to meet together. When Sheriff Arpaio lost the election to Paul in 2016, I was wanting to, Paul to succeed. I didn't have an idea that I wanted to run for sheriff. So when I started to get phone calls in the early part of 2017 from the people that worked at MCSO, the deputies, the detention officers, and civilian employees, I noticed that was not going to happen. So what I wanted to do is put my hat in the ring. To me, it's not about the money. I made twice as much as the chief when I was the chief deputy as the sheriff makes. So it's not about money, it's not about ego. I don't want to run for another office. It's about the people of MCSO and the public that they serve and creating a safe environment for them and a community where businesses want to come and flourish. And now we turn to Sheriff Paul Penzone. The, the greatest problem or challenge that law enforcement faces right now is that we have a broken relationship with the community that we serve. And that is the most critical element to trust. So when I speak to the employees, and this has occurred when we talk about promotions or even people that are graduating from the academy, I emphasize this to them. A lot of things can be taught in law enforcement to be effective in this job. But the one element, the one principle that can't be taught that is most critical is integrity. Your commitment to honesty, your commitment to be just, your commitment to ensure that you respect the law as much as you enforce the law and you respect the very people who have given you the authority to enforce the law. And in life, things can be taken from you. We see right now during a pandemic, there are health risks. When the economic downturn occurs, we know that you could lose your job and lose your property. But the one thing that can never be taken from you is your integrity. It is the one principle that can only be lost if you sacrifice and give it away. So as the head of the organization, I lead by example in protecting that, and I ensure that everyone in the organization is held accountable, transparent, and that they understand that leading by example with integrity is the number one attribute that is required in this office. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. Sheriff, we'll start with you. Um, the judicial verdicts regarding the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office, uh, the civil rights violations, the mandated reforms, do you unequivocally support those judicial verdicts and the mandated reforms? Absolutely, you must. If you are in law enforcement, you take the oath of office, your commitment must be to abide by the laws. I spoke of earlier. And recognizing where this office was in the past and the violations not only of public trust but of civil rights, those were unforgivable. And I impress upon the men and women of the organization, you understood how we got here, and I want to emphasize the majority of the men and women of the organization are thoughtful, with high integrity, and very good at their job. But once you own a debt like this, you are required in order to earn public trust back, to overcome it, to be transparent, and to strive to meet those orders 
Otherwise, you are defying the law, and by taking the oath of office, you have an obligation to, to abide by the law and abide by those orders. Uh, Jerry, you had once uh, described a federal judge's ruling on these things as uh, ludicrous and crap. I did. You still feel that way? Well, I felt that way because the, the two issues the judge found MCSO guilty of, and that's the wrong word in a civil case, is uh, racially biased towards the locations, four locations, and holding Hispanic drivers 13% longer than non-Hispanic drivers. But yet the level of punishment, and again, that's the wrong word, but the public would understand that, was to the extent of other law enforcement agencies across the country as if we were shooting down people in the streets. And I worked for MCSO for a long time, my entire adult life, and I never saw that, ever. And so I was upset about that. It was unprofessional for me to do that. I apologized to the court for being upset about that. I should never have done that. I apologize for that. And I agree with Paul. Um, I worked very diligently to comply with the court's order. The rulings, the mandated reforms, do you agree with those, the verdicts and the reforms? Yes, and I worked very diligently to set the foundation for compliance for the three years that I did. If I may just offer this, you know, this, uh, a statement I believe is Martin Luther King says, uh, you know, uh, an injustice against any one of us is an injustice against every one of us. So the scale is not variable. When you are in law enforcement, you're obligated to ensure you protect the rights of everyone. It doesn't, it's not about shooting someone in the streets or that level of violence. It is about the trust we are given that we have to protect every day so the community believes in us. Because, you know, the police reports, uh, the, I think it's the 21st century police report says, when we trust in you, you are deserving the authority you have, and people will be law-abiding. And when that doesn't occur, we see what we're seeing right now. So any, any, any violation of that level is egregious, no matter what the capacity. Jerry, as a candidate, you say that you were unaware of a lot of what was going on in the Melendrez case. Yet in 2014, you wrote an opinion piece defending uh, Sheriff Joe Arpaio and defending his immigration raids. How do you reconcile your defense of Arpaio then to how you are portraying your relationship in those events now? I'm not changing my relationship with uh, those issues now. I, like Paul, inherited the Melendrez case. I was the chief over the jail system. That case was going on for six years before I actually got involved in it in March of 2013. Okay, It was kept from me by Sheriff Arpaio and Chief Sands, and I was told to stay out of it, so I did. And so as the chief deputy, I had a lot, and Yvonne, you know this better than anybody, I had a lot of issues when I took over as the chief deputy in, 20, in October 2010. And so I already had lawsuits and other issues and major issues to clear up. So I was not involved in Melendrez. I always said that. I've never changed that opinion. However, when I was given the task in 2013 to get involved in Melendrez, that's when I began the learning curve. And coincidentally, uh, Judge Snow even said in March of 2013, that's when the sheriff's office began to comply with his order, when I got involved in that case. The, uh, the second order, Melendrez, I believe you were named in there almost 200 times in one of the uh, categories. It says the designees, including Chief Deputy Sheridan, have directed this manipulation to avoid accountability for themselves, their protégés, and those who have implemented their flawed policies at the cost of fairness. Further, they continue to attempt to conceal additional past treatment of the plaintiff's class as it comes to light in order to avoid responsibility. So to say that Melendrez does not apply to you is, is misleading, if not dishonest. And I, quite, I never said, frankly, I never said ownership that, Paul. I said when I got involved in the case, I worked diligently to comply, and Judge Snow even said the day I got involved in that case, in March 2013, that's when MCSO began to comply with his court order. Which your involvement just, led to the second order that the, that the office currently holds where the, uh, the weight of, of the challenge relative to internal Paul, investigations you know, you know how difficult it is because you've been called in several times by the judge, almost held in contempt of court. I know because I sat in the courtroom a couple of times and watched because you left the meeting early. And now, currently, you've got 1,800 internal investigations. You're going to be hauled in and probably and maybe even 
held in contempt of court, and you know how easy it is to be held in contempt of court. Well, I think Look ownership at, is you, important we've as all much seen as the movie. You, you have a question? We've all, right, all seen the movie. You, My uncle Vinny. I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on, and we can get to some of these issues. Sure. The heart of the Melendrez case was the issue of whether motorist rights were being violated. You have been in charge of implementing those reforms that we've discussed. Hispanic drivers are being held longer, and they're being cited more often during traffic stops compared to non-Hispanics. Are deputies still racially profiling or profiling in any way Hispanics? The, the challenge that we're seeing is actually, and, and any number is unacceptable, because we want to make sure there is no disparate treatment as it relates to our community. Race, you know, color of skin, religion, sexual preference, it does not matter what is unique about you. Everyone is entitled to fair treatment under the law. And what we've seen is about a 4% disparate treatment or differential, meaning that if 100 Caucasians or 100 Hispanics are stopped for the same violation, there will be four more citations issues to that category. So that in and of itself is a problem that we need to address. But as we dig deeper into those factors, and we brought deputies in to do interviews and to review body-worn cameras as well as the reports and things of that nature, to try to determine is it bias, police, uh, bias policing, uh, racial profiling, or is it disparate treatment with other factors and attributes? And right now we're in negotiations to actually have more frequent reviews to ensure that this is individualized. So as the head of the office, I own that responsibility. I'm highly concerned about it, and we are a work in progress. Any number is an unacceptable number if there's disparate treatment, so we're not yet where we need to be, but it is a problem. And anyone who behaves in a manner that is disparate towards an individual will be separated from the organization, and it has been. Sheriff, let me go to ICE. There have been some of your supporters who are still concerned about the relationship your agency has maintained with ICE. Why maintain that relationship? What are some of the requirements there? And is it something you would want to end, or, or where are you holding on to it? Because, again, some supporters don't want you to do that. Yeah, I, I made a commitment to remove politics from the office. So regardless of where influence may come from, when you take that oath of, oath of office, it is to enforce all laws um, with, with impartiality. And we had partnerships with many different federal agencies depending on their mission. Now, I'm a believer that citizenship matters. And you know, to have citizenship, you must have laws to protect it, therefore entry into a nation or other factors. So I can have compassion and empathy for DACA and other factors and look forward to immigration reform. But if you are unlawfully in the nation and accused of a state crime, I believe it is appropriate to allow ICE to interview 100 percent of the inmates to determine if anyone entered unlawfully and should be held to due process, meaning brought in front of an uh, immigration judge and have a review done to determine what process should go next. If we have a problem with the, with the issue of it, so let me just state this. Without that, citizen, citizenship no longer exists. I took an oath of office. I believe in the Constitution. I'll fight to protect it. But if we believe that due process in the law in its current state is appropriate, then I am obligated to enforce it. And if the people want to see something different, then they need to influence legislators to make changes. But I will always enforce or support other agencies who are lawful in their practices. Jerry, do you support the policy, and do you think the sheriff is contradicting himself at all? I don't, I don't think he's contradicting himself. I, this is probably one issue that Paul and I agree on. Uh, the ICE, I, when I was the chief of custody, I got the phone call from Senator Kyle's office to get involved in the 287G program, which cross-certified my detention officers in as ICE agents brought them in, we had 40 detention officers cross-certified, brought them in, uh, and then when that was uh, taken away from MCSO under the Obama administration, uh, we brought the ICE agents in the jail system. It's a good program because ICE mission is to deport criminal illegal aliens, and that's what this program does, and I will continue with that. Sure, if there are some on the Democratic side have talked about, at least using the phrase, abolish ICE. As someone who is a Democrat, you've been in office as a Democrat, is that difficult at all on a daily basis when you have people who are supporters of yours criticizing you for that, even with the explanation you offered? Yeah, I think it's more difficult, and I say that with respect to the Democratic Party for giving me the opportunity to, to run for this office and supporting me through it. Um, as I stated earlier, there's no place for politics and law enforcement, so Democrat, Republican, either way, that should not be the influential factors. So um, abolishing ICE, abolishing law enforcement, all these arguments that we hear, are I'm highly concerned because it's unacceptable. We are a, a nation of the Constitution, the amendments, and laws, and that is what gives us the stability where anyone from any nation, uh, anyone that is a, a community member, a citizen, understands that they will be treated and they will be protected, treated with respect and protected. So the abolishment is not the solution. If we need to make adjustments to correct to ensure that the mission is lawful and constitutional and that it has um, compassion for the people that we serve, 
then make the adjustments in that capacity. But the abolishment of any of these elements means that we will be a lawless nation where families will be at risk for their safety as well as for protection of their property. Um, at its purest form, law enforcement, whether it's state, you know, local, state, county, or federal, we serve a purpose that is a value to the community when done right. And without it, we are a different nation, and, and, and we would fear for the safety of our families. Uh, Jerry, next question for you. Um, you are uh, Sheriff Joe Arpaio's chief uh, deputy for six years. Is a vote for you in this election a return to the Arpaio era? Absolutely not. Don't forget, I worked for the sheriff's office for 38 years. I worked for four different sheriffs during that time period. I am a combination of my religion, my upbringing, uh, my dad, my uncles were New York City cops. I grew up there. I spent 38 years of my life, two years before that as a volunteer deputy sheriff. No one is like anyone else. Just because I was Joe Arpaio's chief deputy, and I know the media loves to hang me with that. I am not Joe Arpaio. I am Jerry Sheridan. I will run the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office the way I finally will be able to, not the way I had to because I worked for him. The sheriff's the boss. It's just like with Sheriff Benzone. He's got his chief deputy. The chief deputy doesn't run the sheriff's office. The sheriff sets the policies. The chief deputy does what they're told, and that's how a law enforcement agency works. So to think that I am going to take Joe Arpaio's policies, I'm not Joe Arpaio. I'm Jerry Sheridan. Sheriff, in the last election, did voters say no to Joe Arpaio's policies, or did they say no to his persona? I think it's really a, a question for those voters to answer. You know, it's not appropriate for me to speak on their behalf. I can only tell you that in my interactions, I think there was a, a mixed bag. You know, it, a lot of community members that believed in him and supported him in the past had grown not only tired but disgusted with what they had seen in the present. And the biggest shame of it all is, as the head of the office, we speak and represent every man and woman in the organization. So we have an obligation to speak words that best represent their sacrifices. And when he defied those values because so much of it was about promoting him and so much about the hierarchy of the organization was about promoting the sheriff, it really defied all the men and women who do the job. So um, part of the, the support came from those who had seen enough of him and wanted to see new leadership. The other part of it was those who believed in me because they saw that my career in law enforcement was consistent, that it was well, about integrity, anybody, and that it was about anybody making, could have making sure the community was safe. Hold on for a second. Are you, if, uh, okay, Jerry, go ahead. Anybody could have beaten Joe Arpaio in 2016. I heard that from Joe Arpaio's mouth after he lost the election. We were sitting there in January in 2017, and he said, Jerry, he said, I knew I shouldn't have run again. I knew anybody that ran against me was going to beat me. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like so to respond. So it's not a referendum on how great Paul is as a leader. Uh, I met with your bio as, as uh, Jerry knows. I walked into his office because I wanted him to hear from me first before I announced in April of 2016. And I did that out of respect. And I sat down with him, and we spoke for a little while, and I asked him the question. You know, he said, you've been in this office for a long time. You know there are challenges. Why don't you have a succession plan? Isn't there someone that you believe is best suited to take this office forward and move it from the space that it's in to the future? Um, because I think it's important for every leader to have a succession plan. We are, the, we are the seat holders, and it's our job to be caretakers of that and to develop the next generation. And his response was, matter of fact, there's no one in this organization that is capable of being the sheriff. And that was when you were his chief deputy. So I'm not saying why he stated that or why he believed that, but I yeah. think it's a shame. Uh, Paul, I'm going to have to go back and ask Sheriff Joe if he's actually said that or not, because I don't believe that yeah. for a second. Well, Jerry, I, I would question what, why, if all those years under his direction, that he hasn't endorsed you and hasn't supported you in this effort if he had that kind of belief in you. You know why, Paul? Let me answer that question. That's because I haven't asked him to, because for that very question that you asked me, because I don't want to be continually saddled with, well, Arpaio endorsed you. He, he's asked me several times, do you want me to endorse you? I tell him, no, Sheriff, I don't want you to endorse me. I'm standing on my own two feet. That's I I could believe who I am. All right, guys, we're going to move on. Sure. There's a backlog of internal affairs investigations into deputies during your tenure. As many as 1,800 are awaiting resolution. 
Sometimes these sorts of inquiries lead to officers getting pulled off their beats or some other actions are taken until their inquiries are resolved. How do these high numbers affect the morale and the stability of the office? And more importantly, do they in any way put members of the public at risk, having well, cops out on the street? Yeah. No, it's a great question. And, and the priority always is that when we have violation that is egregious and could uh, affect the public trust or put the public at risk, that person is removed from service and put on administrative leave. But the length of time in the backlog is unacceptable. The burden that came from the second order that I spoke about when internal affairs was basically taken from the office and overseen by the federal court monitors it became so cumbersome that every and all investigation must go through internal affairs to some extent and it must have a thorough and detailed investigation interviewing all witnesses so the volume expanded dramatically and what was even more challenging is it was weaponized from this context you can make anonymous complaints which is acceptable but we see employees logging complaints against other employees because they are unhappy with them trying to interfere with a potential uh, promotion or other factors so the volume increased dramatically and we just did a uh, we just did some data research and just say this that it would take an additional 90 employees to catch up the backlog so it would be fairly distributed. Go ahead, Ian. Does it question. put members of the public at risk? Uh, as I stated earlier, we take anyone out of service if their action is so egregious that it is a threat to the safety of the community, and we triage those. So we change the process to ensure that those go to the head of, of the uh, investigative process. But one area that needs to be um, articulated is we are within compliance, meaning the quality of these investigations meets all the expectations of the court. It is the time frame that is taking too long that we have to overcome. How would you close that time frame, Jerry? How, how do you resolve all these cases? Well, just so you know, for the three years that I was the chief deputy, I was under that same court order. We had the same basic guidelines. I didn't have this problem with the backlog of internal investigations. You have, by state law, 180 days to comply. Paul is violating state law. He's also violating the court order because of this backlog. And that's because he has allowed the plaintiff's counsel to bastardize the court order, and he's allowed them to take over and create this problem. The problem is in the mid-level managers, they're so afraid of making a mistake because they don't have the backing of the sheriff that this those reports go up and down go back and forth and it's it's just like just over the weekend Paul went out and had one of his detectives 19 years arrested for a crime that he didn't commit there's going to be a huge lawsuit about that because he's overzealous trying to prove a point that he's so that he has so much integrity. Jerry, we have it's less than ridiculous. a minute left. I'm going to give so the yeah, sheriff's um, I, I find it I find it interesting that when there's something that Jerry wants to take credit for in a positive capacity, suddenly he's in charge. But when it's not, then it was on Sheriff Arpaio or myself. And um, I would tell you that the bastardization of things that you're speaking of, as I stated, that order, which was not fully intact while you were the, the chief deputy, the majority of it was applied once I became sheriff, um, was due to your actions covering up internal investigations and all the processes and it is challenging and he says that i've allowed here you go I work again, within the Paul. parameters of the court orders i work underneath the authority of the judge when we implement these and things and we abide by them we have worked to get relief in certain areas to ensure that we're, pra we're protecting these right. elements and the employees within it um, but it's and, just amazing and, to me that someone share, can be responsible for the debt, yet take no responsibility for the outcome. And share, we have no relief from the clock, and we have to stop okay. it right there. So, gentlemen, thank you very much. Time now for closing statements and going in reverse order of our opening remarks. We start with Paul Penzel. I would just say that, you know, so much of law enforcement is having the confidence in the people who are serving and that the person in charge of the organization is someone that you have the utmost trust in. When you have someone uh, like my opponent who was actually not only found in contempt but lied in the courts, if he were to actually pursue a job at any level, any law enforcement agency across the state, he would be denied. He would be added to the Brady List. We can't have public trust and public safety if we have leaders in law enforcement who are unethical and dishonest. I have worked extremely hard to give that back to the community and to give the office back to the men and women so they can take pride and feel that there's purpose in this profession. Now more than ever, law enforcement needs that type of leadership that is predicated in, as I stated earlier, integrity, honesty, transparency, and accountability. The community knows what it feels like now versus the past. You know where we are and where we're headed. So the question really is, 
do you want to continue to move forward? Do you want to go backwards? So I humbly tell you that I'm, I'm honored this was such a privilege to be the sheriff for this first term, and I'm respectfully asking you for your vote so that we can continue to make the progress in the second term. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now the closing statement from Jerry Sheridan. Uh, just real quick. If I was untruthful, I would be on the Brady list, which I'm not. And Post would have taken my post certification, which they did not. So, but my vision is for the sheriff's office is for the future. The primary duty of the sheriff is to keep people safe and protect law and order. So what I'm going to do is restore the drug interdiction unit, which Paul disbanded, bring back These are just honest cast. statements, but it's Well, I didn't interrupt you, uh, okay? Paul, please, please. I didn't interrupt you please. in your closing. <laughs> I'm gonna bring back CAST, which was a detective unit. Paul took that and he called it fate. Uh, I'm going to bring back the animal cruelty unit because animal crimes is something that's very serious in this community and uh, he's got no detectives working those cases that are trained in animal cruelty cases. I'm going to review jail policies to take over the back the control of the jails from the inmates. The jails are in dire straits right now. So the last thing, I'm going to have fun bringing back the nobility of policing to law enforcement and the people, the sheriff's office, so they can better protect people and people's freedoms and liberties. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. And candidates, thank you very much. Good debate. Good to have you here. That is it for now, Yvonne, right? That is it for now. Thank you guys so much for joining us this election 2020 debate for the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. And you can watch these debates online again at azpbs.org. And join us Tuesday at 5 p.m. for a debate for Arizona's 9th Congressional District. That will be followed by a week from today by our debate for Maricopa County Attorney. And as I said before, that's it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thanks so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Coming up on Cronkite News. Vaccinates thousands against the flu. How that process could be used when COVID vaccinations become available.